Hello and welcome to the Alive Kenya Book Club. Did you know that Haggai calls Christ the desire of all nations and we may call him the desire of all ages even as he is the king of ages? It is the purpose of this reviews to set forth Jesus Christ as the one in whom every longing may be satisfied. While we shall glimpse into the life of Jesus through Ellen White's desire of ages, we may yet say the half has never been told. May the fullness of Christ quench all your unsated desires and the Holy Spirit bring life to the words in this book. Chapter 19, At Jacob's Well. Based on the chapters found in John, which is chapter 4, verse 1 through to 42, that's where the pericope is picked from. And uh, one thing we see, which is from the onset, is that uh, Jesus is passing through Samaria as he comes from Galilee together with the disciples. And uh, this is no abrupt move, but intentional. He sees that uh, these guys, the Jews and the Samaritans, were bitter enemies. And as far as possible, they avoided dealing with each other to a point where if there was a way to get to either side of the country, they would rather use the long route in order to avoid getting in contact with the other people. So you find that the Jews never opted to pass through Samaria, even though it was the nearest. They would rather go all the way near the big seas in order to get themselves to Galilee or on the other side. And it's from here that we see Christ being intentional about our lives. And for me, that's one thing that from the onset stood out for me to say he is always ready to reach out and you always strive to get to us and so the famous story is that jesus is sitting by the well the disciples have also gone to buy food and there as they go they ask a favor of the samaritans or in their way to benefit them they didn't even think of christ as they did uh, their purchasing and just him allowing the disciples to leave him by himself also communicates something that at times we do need time to ourselves and just time with the Lord in this case. So we are told Jesus is sitting by the well, he's hungry and thirsty, the journey has been long. And so just at about noontime, the thirst increases even all the more. And okay, it's from here that those debates are whether he was he human, was he divine. I think we've got concrete evidence here to say he, could, he was both actually because we are told the Son of God thirsted. What a paradox. The living water thirsts. The living bread hungers. And so as this whole thing is happening, a woman of Samaria approached and she seemingly was unconscious of his presence. And so she went about her busy schedule, fetched water. But just as she was about to turn away, Jesus asked her for a drink. And this came as a shock because uh, of the relationships that were there between Samaritans and the Jews. And it's for that reason that... Uh, in those times, we are told the Oriental world would uh, definitely treasure water. They called it the gift of God. To offer a drink to a thirsty traveler was held to be a duty so sacred that the Arabs of the desert would go out of their way in order to perform it. But because of this hatred between Jews and Samaritans, the woman was prevented to offer this gift of God. And so the savior again was still seeking to find a way to this heart and it speaks to the situations of missionaries to say at times let us always find a common ground as we seek to deliver god's word it would be well to of course go on with our studies encourage people that are within our circles but if possible let us find a good avenue to their heart let us uh make them comfortable the pen of inspiration in the in the famous book uh, the ministry of healing talks about how christ method only seemingly is the best and will help us to preach the gospel 
And when we ask, how is this Christ method? She labors and says, well, he won their confidence. And then that's when Christ gave them the gospel. So in this case, this offer of kindness might have been rejected, but trust awakens trust. So the woman, though she realizes this is a Jew that she's up with and talking, for a moment, her trust is built and, well, she begins to entertain. So she saw Jesus was a Jew, but in a surprise, she forgot that, well, I need to grant this man's request, but tried to reason for it. How is it, she said, the writer says, that thou being a Jew, ask drink of me, which am I, a woman of Samaria? And it's in that moment that Jesus now begins speaking to her in seemingly what sounds like parables. She can't understand. He tells her, say, well, if you knew the gift of God, and he who is saying it to thee, give me water to drink, you would have in turn asked for living water. I loved in the prayer how that line was echoed. So you wonder that I should ask you of you a small favor, just water from the well. But well, have you thought about the one who's asking you? And you'd have asked to be given everlasting water. The woman didn't comprehend the words of Christ. And so she now just was supposing that, well, maybe Jesus spoke of the world before, that world that she was at. And so she goes on into this history to say, well, uh, you guys uh, believed in what not. And uh, as Jews, even us as Samaritans, we've got what we believed in. And all that conversation. But Jesus tells her to say, even if I don't have nothing to draw with from this water, because she's asking him to say, you have nothing to draw, but you're talking about uh, this water that you give me. And so she was looking back to her fathers and forward to the Messiah's coming. So she, while it's in this dilemma, she still had the hope of this Messiah. But what she didn't know was that the Messiah was right close beside her. And the question is asked to say, how many thirsting souls today are close by the living water, yet looking far away for the wellsprings of life? It could be maybe even with us. You know, time and again, we love to project this need of a savior, this absence of a savior on the lives out there. But have we also wondered to say at some time or at some point, we ourselves are out of the way and look for other places to find this living water, while Christ himself is right beside us. He then says, say not in thine heart, who shall ascend in heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep? That is to go away from above or maybe from the dead the word is nigh in thee even in the mouth and in thy heart therefore if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the lord jesus and shall believe in thine heart that god hath raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved salvation is never far fetched child of god and the reason i believe and com I am convinced is because christ is the one that grants us it would have been the case that we go far in search of it if we were redeeming ourselves. But in this case, it is Jesus who redeems us. So quickly, we run through the other portion. The conversation has started and uh, Jesus, we see not immediately attending to that question, but he's trying to see and establish just how this woman can open her heart much more. And from there, I also learned that in our course, our endeavor to allow others to come to the faith or just to get to know Christ for themselves, maybe we should, and not maybe, definitely we ought to adopt the Christ method, as uh, Minister Villain says, because it also involves being patient with people. Many of us want to fast track the cause. Uh, perhaps maybe that's how we were converted or that's how we got to a place we are at with the Savior and we feel that's the standard way. 
But well, look at this. He who seeks to quench this thirst at the fountain of this world will drink only to thirst again. So there is a portion of them that they feel is quenching the desires of their heart. But once again, they'll come back. So we should be patient enough to understand that uh, sometimes, partially, men everywhere are satisfied, but ultimately they end up being unsatisfied with the life. And so they long for something to supply the need of the soul. But even before we may deliver and grant them that need, we should endeavor to take it a day at a time, continue to uh, subject them to prayer and commit them to the Lord in prayer. And for this need, for something that shall quench the thirst that they have, the longing of the soul, the greatest need of this world now is the desire of all nations in Jesus Christ. And this is the divine grace which he alone does what can impart as he is living what and purifying this goes back to what jeremiah tells us of how christ is the fountain of living water from the sea he gives this analogy of water and uh, a distinction would be also in how fountains were perceived in those times from the old testament to the current times jesus we see patiently leading that conversation and allowing the woman rather to lead but watching for the opportunity again to bring the truth home closer to our heart at times we should allow people to give us a bit of what they perceive and think of god before we we talk about how we feel they should be one thing Christ always did is that he desired to lift the thoughts of his ear above matters of form and ceremony and question of controversy. In every conversation we have, what is the ultimate goal? Is it to win a conversation and prove to the person who are speaking to that, well, we are the ones who know? Just during the four days holiday, someone quoted Mother Teresa who said, I love your Christ, but hate your Christians. So what becomes of every conversation we hold? Is it to help us propel to Christ or just want to, 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 to win the conversation? But another interesting phrase comes in towards the end of the conversation that Christ holds and sustains with this woman for some time. And it's about when he talks about the hour coming and the hour being that very time. And this hour is that believers should worship God in truth and in spirit. It should be from line 189. It says, uh, coming down to the next uh, paragraph, it says, a desire to lift the thoughts of his ear above the matters of form and ceremony and question of controversy. The hour cometh, he said, and now is, when true worshippers shall worship the Father in truth and in spirit. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Here we are told, is declared the same truth that Jesus had revealed to Nicodemus, which is the preceding chapter. So we see that sometimes is trying to build on the thought and i believe it was revealed yesterday to say man shall be born from above he cannot see the kingdom of god except he does so so he now brings the whole truth and it's by this moment that he tries to say well religion is not just being confined to external forms many of us want to fulfill duties and whatnot but well religion is far much beyond that especially that which comes from god because it will lead one to ultimately turn back to god and so we must be born of this spirit just like we learn from this um, woman and so the woman is impressed with what jesus is done and how he has talked about him and uh, he has talked about her rather and even as he vividly beams her past but with the hope that, well, she should see 
and appreciate the words that come. Her state of mind was now ready to receive the noblest of revelation, for she was interested in scripture and the Holy Spirit had been preparing her mind to receive more light. I found that for me quite worthwhile to say at times we review more light to a people that have not been prepared by the Holy Spirit. So let us always take time to prepare uh, people through prayer. On the flip side, the disciples are back from their errand and now they find a shock. This master at the well speaking with the woman of Samaria, something not so common with the Jews. And so they are looking and trying to see, well, what's going on? When the woman had gone, they ended up asking and asked him to say, well, after eating, they, they realized he was silent, absorbed in some form of meditation, but his face was beaming with light and they feared to interpret his communion with heaven. But they knew that he was very tired and weary and thought in their duty to remind him of his physical necessities. But Jesus also recognized their loving interest and he said, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. We just see that encounter of where the spirit is glowing. Jesus is in the spirit and seemingly the disciples feel there's need for for, for what's this for him to even have a moment with them. So many lessons I believe all of us glean from this chapter. But for me, one that stands out as I was shaving in the summarized bulletin is how Christ is number one intentional about meeting us. He set and allowed the disciples to use the unfamiliar route to their destination to Galilee. Number two, it's how Christ initiates conversations that seek to, for us to find eternal truth. And number three, it's how it's always deliberate and at times allows us to lead the conversation. As others will be sharing in their messages, some of which I'll be uh, reading through, Benjamin says, patience with the erring, something we need. Amen. You see, never to rush and want to run through these matters. Um, Flyder also writes this to say, a woman of Samaria approached and seemingly unconscious of his presence. And well, she filled a pitcher with water and she turned to go away, but Jesus asked her for a drink. Such a favor no Oriental would withhold. There's something we made mention of how this water was always, uh, giving water was always something that was important yes that uh, except was from page 19 the one that uh Flyder just shared jesus did not convey the idea that mainly one draft of the water of life would suffice the receiver because he who tests of the love of christ will continually long for more he who tests of the love of christ will continually long for more but he seeks for nothing else the riches, honors, and pleasures of the world do not attract him. The constant cry of his heart is, more of thee and he who reveals to the soul it is a necessity is waiting to satisfy its hunger and thirst. Every human resource and dependence will, will fail. The cisterns will be emptied. The pools become dry, but our Redeemer is an inexhaustible fountain we may drink and drink again and ever find a fresh supply he in whom christ dwells as within himself the fountain of blessing a well of water springing up into everlasting life from this source he may draw strength and grace sufficient for all his needs amen one singer says if i have christ then i have it all when you study john chapter 4 and also this chapter it often is uh, like a rebuke or a challenge to us as professed christians because you see what uh, is the ultimate result of us having an encounter with christ and mm. we learn this through the example of this woman uh, of samaria 
and from the chapter we also usually get something interesting when we come to see that the effect of whatever happened at Pentecost was not only a result of the disciples being imbued by the Holy Spirit, but they came to reap the harvest that Christ had, had been sowing from the time of Adam when you read page 192 thereabout. And so coming to this woman, we see what uh, will be our response once we've been filled by the love of Christ and we have experienced him. Because when you read the last two chapters, uh, two paragraphs rather of the chapter, it summarizes the whole point. I told that as soon as uh, she had found the savior, the Samaritan mm -hmm. woman brought others to him. She proved herself a more effective missionary than his own disciples. I told that the disciples saw nothing in Samaria to indicate that it was an encouraging field their thoughts were fixed upon a great work to be done in the future. They did not see that the yeah. that right around them was a harvest to be gathered, yeah. Yeah. but through the woman whom they despised, a whole city full were brought to hear the Savior. She carried the light at once to her countrymen. And the last paragraph finishes by saying that this woman represents the working of a practical faith in Christ. Every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. He who drinks of the living water becomes a fountain of life. The receiver becomes a giver. The grace of Christ in the soul is like a spring in the desert, welling up to refresh all and making those who are ready to perish eager to drink of the water of life. So personally, to me, uh, when I often study this character, uh, this Samaritan woman, amongst other individuals whom Christ usually does mighty deeds to them in the Gospels, and they end up evangelizing to many people even before uh, the disciples of Christ did this. It serves often at times as a rebuke to me as an individual, and I often tend to ask myself, what have I done uh, for Christ, or how have I displayed the love that I've received of Christ? And if we would be having that love of Christ warm in our hearts, I told that uh, we will not uh, sit and look or wait for others to perish. And Christ says, uh, I think it's in Luke, that behold, the harvest is white, ready to be harvested. So uh, from this chapter, we get again the call to evangelism that it is us who are responsible to either hasten or to delay the coming of Christ. With the measure of truth we receive, we are required to impart, and it's a prayer that that little effort daily we put uh, may be of benefit to our soul, to win that soul to Christ, because also we cannot just bombard people with truth, and as David said as he was beginning, we ought to be having that patience with the erring because as Christ has been patient with us to the point he has allowed us to obtain his salvation or to be born again in him, we also have to have that patience in the erring so that we can rightly represent the character of God. When you read Ministry of Healing on 62.2, we read that uh, it's talking about uh, how, how uh, Christ will work and we read that we will not be asking, uh, are they worthy, but how can I benefit them? You see, for example, Christ, Christ would have, when he withdrew from uh, uh, where he was in uh, Galilee, he could have gone to Judea and other places, but he decided to pass through Samaria so that he can reach the lost sheep of Israel. So we see even us, we will not be asking, uh, uh, are, are these people worthy of me sharing the gospel with them, but we'll be asking, how can we benefit them? Uh, you could even ask yourself at uh, the cost of this soul and you realize that it is the blood of Christ that redeemed these people. So you'll be the thing will be burning inside your heart. You'll not be like the disciples who are coming and are surprised that uh, how is it that a Jew is talking to? So it will be like the example of us and his dear talking to a, let me say, a Protestant, uh, the Protestants of the churches. You'll not be looking at uh, how will you, uh, uh, like, are they worthy to receive that? light that you have but how can you benefit them how can you share the light that you received with them because that love will be burning inside you and you'll be 
uh, more than willing to share it with others. Yeah. What really stood out for me was in page um page one ninety where um the um Samaritan woman was able after she had received this light, she was so delighted and she went out into the city and was like, Come see a man, which told me all the things that I ever did. Is this is not this the Christ? And uh you could it could be seen that you know she had met Christ and her face had changed and even her her whole appearance had changed and um it was by this that she was able to convince others to come and 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 you know come see this man and um even as missionaries of god we are to go out to bring others and we are to tell them come see this man that we know we have already met and and we have this experience with him and and this is how you know he has changed our lives and yeah we are to be his living agencies and uh, we have that responsibility of, um, yeah, Christ requires of us individual service. And this is whether uh, this is sowing or reaping, we are working for God. Um, one, of, one will scatter the seed and others will gather the harvest. Um, and both the sower and the reaper receive wages. So we must be, um, we should be delighted to take part um, and to labor with Christ, you know, and even as the Holy Spirit works in their heart. As soon as she had found the Savior, the Samaritan woman brought others to him. She proved herself a more effective missionary than his own disciples. The disciples saw nothing in Samaria to indicate that it was an encouraging field. Their thoughts were fixed upon a great work to be done in the future. They did not see the right around them, that right around them was a harvest to be gathered. But through the woman whom they despised, a whole seat full were brought to hear the Savior. She carried the light at once to her countrymen. And so this is a representation of some practical faith in Jesus Christ. So let us not postpone the redeeming power of Christ to say not until the latter rain, not until that particular time. The thought is that let's do it now. So may the good Lord bless us. Mm -hmm.